I have a pleasure to interview today uh, Mr. Risto Silasma, who is the founder and chairman of F-Secure, but also the chairman of former chairman of ELISA and Nokia. He has invested in, in over 35 uh, great companies already, uh, including Inclus, and we are very happy about that. We'll be talking a bit about the background of Inclus and, and more generically about risk management and scenario planning, where Risto have gained a lot of insight and experience about. So really nice to talk to you. It's great to be here. To kick off, I would like to know, Risto, uh, why you got interested in Inclus in the first place. Well, I was asked to organize a economic discussion related to the president of Finland's annual Kultaranta talks, where I had a team of, I gathered together a team of international business people, economists, specialists in, in various areas. And the topic was what kind of an impact will the COVID-19 have on economy? And if you recruit chairman of some of the largest companies in the world and, and Nobel winning economists and, and so forth, you can't expect them to spend a lot of time on your project. So I decided that we'll do as much as we can offline in a, on a platform so that we don't need to, need to be there at the same time. So people can contribute when they have time. And then we'll only have a two hour long joint session. And I was looking for a tool for the brainstorming part, for gathering their input on what kind of impacts will COVID-19 have on the economy. So I decided that we'll start gathering the impacts themselves and then categorizing them and rating them on how big the impact is in the short term and in the long term and what can we do to mitigate the negative impacts and what can we do to maximize the positive impacts. And I started browsing the internet looking for similar projects, tools that have been used, even thinking about coding something myself for that. And then Luckily I found, you did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it would have been fun. <laughs> yeah. But then I found Inclus. Yeah. Were you happy with the results of the process? Well, actually, I was very, very happy with, with it. The, the tool worked really well. And I think we got some very interesting output from the team. And it, it sort of provided a good basis for the actual discussions. But also there's a research team from the Aalto University who has taken the results and is thinking about publishing a paper. So if we can achieve a scientific paper that will be published from just a few hours of work that is relatively uncoordinated, then that's a really good result. Yeah. And that's actually quite interesting process in my mind, because when you think about a collaborative assessment, impact assessment, you, you might need, think that you would need dozens of people or hundreds of people to contribute to evaluate dozens of of phenomena, drivers, impacts. But in this case, you had, if I understood right, eight very high-level professional mm -hmm. experts evaluating those, those issues. Yeah. And in my mind, that's very interesting that you also can do a collaborative assessment with uh, very uh, sort of prestigious but top experts mm -hmm. in their fields. And we came up with 120-ish impacts. So a fairly large number, yeah. which were all then evaluated in the dimensions I mentioned. And some of them, of course, I had to combine because they were the same thing in different words. We ended up with about 80 impacts in the, in the end, which yeah. we then categorized into a number of categories. And then you can start analyzing that, for example, looking at what are the the biggest short-term impacts? Mm. What are the, the biggest negative impacts overall? What's the difference between the biggest short-term impacts and the biggest long-term impacts and why? 
and you sort of get to look at that space of answers, that multidimensional space from a number of points of view, and all of those points of view will give you richer understanding of that topic. And I think that's one of the, the benefits of using Incus, because if, when you have that opportunity to view the data from any angle you want. Yeah, definitely. And I was very proud of being part of the process in a sense that you had uh, quite high level people participating, uh, thinking and discussing about the most, most urgent and pressing issues for Finland, but, but for Europe more widely. And uh, one question that I'm really interested in is that uh, often it feels like that the top management, the chairmen and the CEOs and, and, and the top management often leaves the assessments of, of mm -hmm. big, big sort of decisions or, the, or scenario assessments and, and, and risk assessments to, to the experts or maybe to the middle management to, to figure out. But how do you feel about this, the, this uh, question? Should the top management actually conduct the assessments every now and then themselves properly? Well, at least they need to initiate those projects. They need to participate in them and they need to lead them. But exactly. then you should involve a lot of people. Yeah. And that's the, the technical challenge. How do you involve a, a huge number of people in a productive way? Yeah. So that the, the great ideas that bubble from, you know, underneath, that they actually become understood yeah. at the top. Yeah, exactly. And it's not, not always easy and we need great tools for that. Yeah. And Inclus is a sort of a democratic tool. Yeah. Because once the ideas or the challenges or the risks or whatever you are analyzing are in the system, it doesn't matter whether it came from the CEO or from the janitor. It's, yeah. it's just the same kind of a representation in the system. Yeah, and it's data and you can validate how relevant it is and how accurate it is and, and so on. And but people, definitely people it's, yeah. validate them, they don't know who came up with it. Yeah. So yeah. you can rate the CEO's idea as, as awful without knowing that it came from the CEO. Yeah, although we can distill a little bit the, the results if we want to in, in e class to see. Sure. To see who are the who are the top management, who Unless are the real the CEO experts. Unless the came up with the bad ideas, then you don't need to do that. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly like that. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, the sort of uh, the challenge, one of the challenges that we've understood that we have to we have to address is is that the, often often the top management won't understand the results of of even thorough analysis or or studies which have been done by experts and researchers, etc. They don't simply have the time to really go through them. Well, that's, that's one of the biggest misunderstandings in leadership, that they don't have time to understand what is relevant for their business. Yeah. That should not be possible. Exactly. And I feel very strongly as part of my sort of leadership philosophy that the, the top management needs to in a regular way, stop whatever they are doing and reflect on whether they are doing the right things, whether they are focused on the right things, whether their time is being spent in a sensible way. As an example, some five, six years ago, in the technology industry, which I have always lived in, mm -hmm. was taken by storm by the concept of machine learning. Yep. Everyone's talked about machine learning. All the CEOs and chairmen, they were talking about the importance of machine learning and how we are investing in it and how we will be a leader in it and, and so forth. And none of them understood, or 99% of them did not understand what machine learning is. And mm -hmm. I was one of those parrots yeah. doing that talking. Yeah. Somebody gave me a slide set or I heard somewhere some nice one-liners and I was repeating them really like a parrot. And then I sort of one morning I woke up and felt really dishonest about that. Mm -hmm. Because if the leadership doesn't understand the technologies that will define the company's future, then are they leaders at all? Yeah. So the, the long story short, I started programming again after a break of 20 plus years and did six courses of machine learning programming 
taught by a Stanford University uh, professor, and it was so much fun. I really loved yeah. it. And my objective was not to become a professional programmer again, yeah. but to really understand how machine learning works, what you can do with it, what its limits are at the moment, and then teach it to others. Yeah. And I have been traveling around the world talking to CEOs and chairmen and the United Nations Secretary General and presidents and cabinets trying to explain to them what they should know about machine learning. Yeah. Because they are the leaders. It is their duty to understand the, the key matters that will define their success or failure. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting and, and what we found in our processes with, with many large organizations doing risk management but also foresight and scenario planning is that when they have multiple different technological uh, trends that they should be aware of at least at least to think out how, they, how, how they're impacting uh, their businesses, what sort of opportunities they, they are posing. Uh, our, our process, yeah. admitting what they don't know. Exactly, exactly. Because it's, yeah. it's not that we all have to start programming machine learning systems, but if we pretend to ourselves as well as to everyone else that we understand, let's say, quantum computing, if that happens to be relevant for your business, and you pretend that you understand it, but you actually don't, then that's dangerous. Yeah. But if you know that you don't understand it, and then you can think, what should I do about this? Yeah. How, how do I verify that my... CIO or my CTO actually understands enough about this yeah. and then at least take that action. True. Then you're fine. True. But don't pretend that you understand something you, you actually don't. Yeah. We sometimes ask even the level of knowledge, also the impact and, and the perceived probability of different risks, but also the knowledge based about that risk. And then we can see where we can have perceived uh, high probable, uh, high probability, high impact risks, which they are not sure about their own assessments. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of dangerous risks that they have an idea that that could be dangerous, but they don't know enough about it. But it's a, it's a dimension that we should be honestly just thinking about how much do we under know and understand mm -hmm. uh, these different threats and opportunities. And once you do that, you can also help others to learn. When in Nokia, when I did my own machine learning deep dive and then I, I gave a lecture to our employees which was then put on the internet as a video and it's on, on YouTube as well, been seen by 100,000 people so far and people noticed that hey our chairman has started programming and I'm a programmer but I don't understand machine learning. I have to study. And then a lot of people even came to me saying that, hey, I work in the, this and this R&D unit and I've been spending my, my evenings and weekends studying machine learning. As I was so embarrassed that mm. you know more about that than I do. And then the company can help people to learn by providing material and courses and access to, yeah. to the best content and teachers. And the interesting thing was that when we asked our employees in a employee survey, satisfaction survey, well, two questions out of the, the hundred that are relevant to this one was, how well do you think you understand how machine learning works? And then the other, other one was, how strongly do you believe in the strategy and success of the company? The interesting thing was that the people who answered that I do understand machine learning were the most optimistic about the company's future. And the people who said that I don't understand it interesting. were by far interesting. the least optimistic. Yeah. It was clearly such a strong correlation yeah. that it was almost one had to ask oneself whether there's some sort of a causality here. Yeah. And the only explanation that I could come up with was that many of those people who answered yes, they had learned about it very recently through this project drive in the company to 
to teach and learn and develop ourselves. And when people develop their competencies, they become optimistic about the future. Yeah. When they feel that I'm becoming a better me, I'm optimistic. Yeah. And I work harder and I'm more creative and more resilient. And, yes. More resilient. So you can actually achieve great unexpected benefits by doing stuff like this. And yeah. Inclus can help you find out what these blind spots are. Yeah. Find out whether the management is full of hot air mm -hmm. by asking people underneath whether they believe that the management knows what they are actually doing, for example, or figure out what these new technologies are that will impact us. Yeah. And then maybe also brainstorm what should we do, what kind of program should we launch that would be helpful in educating us on these technologies that we have identified. Exactly. And, and something that we have found out in many processes, and I guess it's self-evident even when you think about it, but, but the variety of risks and, and opportunities and different drivers and threats out there, it's impossible for an individual leader to understand all of them. Mm -hmm. So why should you even pretend, mm -hmm. you know? So, so I think that it's, it's important to go through the list, send it out to everybody, go through the opportunities and, and threats. And even when we're talking about the opportunities, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of investing your time and effort into figuring out what are the opportunities. Mm -hmm. Should we move forward to the opportunities? Should we seize the opportunities? And if you don't ask that, from anybody, you won't even start thinking about mm -hmm. the opportunities. And, and I think that that's one part of, of, of the greatness of, of INCLUS. Another part is that when everybody's a little bit unsure of the, of the risks, because you're force, when you're doing foresight or risk assessments, you're always predicting the future, which is not non-exact science, which is always difficult. Uh, there's always some fuzziness in the assessments. And it's more or less often a subjective mm -hmm. matter how probable risk a risk is or, or scenario is. But the real reliability of the assessments actually increased, or at least you can see how well you can rely the assessments with INCLUS, because you can understand a little bit the deviations, the expert group differences. Uh, you, can, you can understand uh, from where people are coming to the assessments in a, in a, in a sort of Mental, mental way where they're coming to, to assess the, the things they have hey, different be, impacts. Before, the, before yeah. we dive too deep into INCLUS, yeah. how did you come up with INCLUS? What's, what's the background? Yeah, well, in my mind, that's an interesting background at least. So, so, so I co-founded uh, INCLUS with Juha Törmänen, who's a mathematician, a uh, very, very smart guy and software developer. And he was working with me in, in CMI, Crisis Management Initiative, founded by President Martti Ahtisaari, a, a, a conflict resolution peace mediation office. And, and I led a methods and tools team there. And we had a small team which was responsible over traveling to 15 different countries whenever the conflict parties needed help in, in, in so-called shared analysis. So in a peace mediation process, you, you come to a, a situation where the, where the conflict parties simply have too many issues listed, mm -hmm. either as the drivers of the conflicts or as problems to be solved together to make the agreement, uh, the comprehensive peace agreement, where CMI is, is often aiming for. Very, mm -hmm. very ambitious work, very difficult work, very sensitive work, very uh, serious work. So there uh, we helped the conflict parties first. With uh, We started with Excel sheets and so on, but we started to develop uh, um, a software, MVPs, on, on how to bring the different views together uh, of the conflict parties so that they can see where they uh, have, have commonalities in their, in their views, where they can see, see maybe win-win solutions, uh, where they can clearly see that this would be a bad thing for both parties, lose-lose scenarios. And, and, and they, from there, sort of to try to prioritize uh, uh, the matters where they should be focusing the actual mm -hmm. dialogue and peace mediation processes. And these tools sort of structure that analytical challenge that the po conflict parties have. And, it's actually yeah. amazing how similar businesses are to, to geographic conflicts. Exactly. They're often 
several parties, whether it be those functions or owners and management or exactly. customers and, exactly. and, and management. And oftentimes it's difficult to identify the common themes. Yeah. It's, it's not just in, in conflicts, it's also in everyday business. And the same functionality works. When, when I started using Inclus, that is of course one thing. I, I think it's a great tool. But then as we got to know each other a little bit more, I started thinking about Inclus as an investment opportunity, wanting to help you bring this great tool for many other people. I was also attracted by your background. Because as an investor, I have found that it's always better to, to invest in a team that has both their hearts and minds in the business. We do. And many companies only have their minds and maybe their wallets in yeah. the business, but their hearts are not. Yeah. And your background sort of emphasized that your hearts are in this because you still do crisis management work. Quite a lot, yes. We are working now currently in four conflicts, for example, in Yemen, Libya, Iraq, Myanmar, uh, mm. with, with CMI. So some of the most hairiest conflicts that the, the, there is in the mm. face of the earth and, and million, millions of people are suffering from those. So this is something very important for us, but, but uh, and it helps us to sort of uh, persist and go through the challenges yeah. and, and we will not stop, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, whatever happens in a way that we try to contribute to that work anyhow yeah. every, in, 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 in the way that we have, uh, have the capabilities. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's something very important for us, but we believe that, uh, that it's, it's, it's also important to understand uh, and, and help the complexities of the corporations where they are now facing, for example, COVID uh, mm -hmm. has shown quite quite clearly that there's a need for for analytical, quick analytical tools to help to sort out the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we feel that there's uh, quite a lot of analogical uh, and commonalities between the peace mediation work and the, and the corporate work, like you mentioned, for example, in, in the complex uh, construction projects, large large co construction projects. You have multiple parties, mm -hmm. you have architects, you have designers, you have mm -hmm. the consultants, you have the ordering party, you have subcontractors, etc. And they're coming from totally different tribes mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to the project. And it's, it's very interesting work, very demanding, challenging work to actually manage those projects well well until the end. So, so we have gotten very good feedback from, from mm -hmm. the corporation, the construction sector, for example, managing the complexities of their projects and the risks together mm -hmm. to really share and understand the understanding of the risks together. So uh, we have been more than sort of excited to, to learn mm -hmm. more and more uh, about these different corporate processes. Yeah. Risto, as you've been working with, uh, with startups, small, very small companies, uh, growth companies, and, and also with giant players in the, in the economic field, um, could you tell a bit about your experiences, why risk management and scenario planning is important for today's corporations? Well, there are of course many reasons why they are sure. important, but let's start with one that is not necessarily obvious. Yeah. All companies at least should want to grow. And of course you can grow in two ways. You can do growth by acquisitions or through transactions, which is sort of easy to do, but difficult to implement and integrate. And there are a lot of risks involved in that. And you need to be very careful how you do that. But then organic growth, one could easily think that it's not a risk management topic, but actually it's nothing else. Because there's two ways to grow organically, or two things that you need to do. Well, the first two, of course, are you have great services and products, and you operate efficiently, but all companies try to do that. Mm -hmm. But the two that really matter, the first one is that you operate in a growing industry. Sounds very simple, but not all industries grow but some parts of them grow. And then maybe some parts of them decline. So the question is, how do you shift your focus, your resources, your investments, your operations into the growing parts? 
And how do you manage the risks of doing that? Because even if you expect something to grow, it might not grow in the future. Very interesting. So it becomes a risk management or a scenario planning exercise. It yeah. becomes a foresight exercise. And the other thing that you need to do is to be different. Because if you are exactly like all other companies, why would you grow faster than they do? And if you want to be different, okay, there are many different ways you can do that. So you have to figure out what is your way of differentiation. And there's always a risk in being different. If you're different in the wrong way and you don't understand that quickly enough, then you'll fail. Yeah. Or at least you'll underperform. If you try first one way of differentiation, it doesn't work. You need to shift quickly to the next one. Or maybe you try two ways at the same time. So it's trial and error, it's experimentation. Super interesting points. So risks are involved in, on the other hand, on growth and on, on differentiation. And in all companies. Yeah. It's not just traditional risk management where you try to figure out what kind of catastrophic things can happen, strategic risk, operational risk, and maybe uh, sort of earthquakes and natural disasters and so forth, which have nothing to do with you, but just environmental risks. True, true. External, unforeseen mm -hmm. shocks. And those, are, those are what people always think about when we talk about risk management. But I'm much more interested in, in the kind of risk management that you do when you try to create success. Yep. And if you don't take any risks, that's weird also. So you have to always take risks. Yeah, well, living is a risk. Yeah, <laughs> true. true. And risk management is not supposed to minimize risks. That's not the role or purpose of risk management. It is to decide which risks you take and how you take them. It's not to avoid risks, it's to take them the right way. Interesting. When you, when you see sometimes these sort of stagnant companies which are not that willing to grow or needed to differentiate in the marketplace, have you seen sort of what sort of looming risks there might then become uh, for those type of companies who think they are not mm -hmm. taking risks because they, they are quite self-assured and mm -hmm. have, they have a strong, strong well, market positions. Et there are many classical examples and of course Nokia's handset business is something that I observed, uh, we all observed from quite close by. But maybe even a better one is, is the Kodak moment. So Kodak was the, the dominant company in photographic film-based industry. And their best business was photographic paper, where they had a dominant global position with huge margins. It was actually not film, it was the paper. And did you know who invented digital photography? You no. can guess from the context. It was Kodak. Yeah. Yeah. They, they built the first digital camera. Yeah. And they continued improving it. And they were the best position to understand that there will be one day when digital cameras will be better than film-based cameras. And just a few years before, that actually happened and digital photography just took over. They presumably, or well, that's what the story is, they had a board meeting and a management meeting where they discussed this. And because they had such a high market share in photographic paper and such high margins, they made a conscious decision not to invest in digital photography. Ouch. And they, they documented that decision and it was based on the fact that they, they had such high margins to lose and such a high market share to lose if they start disrupting themselves. Ouch. And but of they, course, they went bankrupt yeah. or into chapter 11. Yeah. It's an interesting, interesting book uh, called Open by Andra Agassi. Mm -hmm. 
and he explains how he was the face of the Kodak moment with his long hair and a big smile, happy wife, happy life, and and uh, and and he kind of became the face of of Kodak, mm -hmm. and uh, they they thought that the company was in a smiling, happy place until they were not. And uh, tragic mm -hmm. story in a sense, interesting. Why, in your mind, uh, risk management and scenario planning is important for today's world? What kind of trends and risks and drivers you see rising currently? Well, risk management is part of building successful companies, not just because you want to avoid disasters, but also because you want to make the right decisions. And in order to make the right decisions, you need to be able to weigh different alternatives. And then you need to understand risk. There's risk in success, and you need to understand it, and you need to be method methodical about that. But today, if we just think about sort of more traditional risk thinking, the, the world is more uncertain than it probably has ever been before. And True. I'd like to say that or claim that never before has it been as likely that if you have a single plan, it will fail because you had the wrong assumptions. It's easier to make wrong assumptions now than ever before because we have a lot of environmental risks, starting with the climate warm warming that is threatening humanity overall, how fast it will progress, whether there will be a tipping point when the glaciers will all melt and, and South Pole will melt and, and everything, you know, the sea level will go up 50 meters. There's geopolitical risk. The US elections are going to be held next week, but it's not just which president will be elected. There will still be tensions with China, regardless of which one will win. There will be issues with uh, Taiwan and China. There will be issues with migration. There will be challenges with clean water, clean air. So there are huge trends on their way that may disrupt life as we know it. So how could you just make a single plan under these circumstances? You, you really shouldn't. You should make a number of plans based on different assumptions. And then you should track on a regular basis how those assumptions change or what you know about those assumptions change. And then you can understand which scenario from your business's point of view or your country's point of view is now the most likely and what you should do to mitigate the risks in that scenario and what can you do to, to maximize the benefits. Exactly. And, uh, and often it seems like that uh, you, you should have multiple plans, but also understand, like you said, the, uh, the assumptions behind it and the scenarios driving those those essential assumptions that you make for your plan. And more often than not, uh, the most likely scenario is a mixture of many different kinds of scenarios, very bad ones and very nice ones. But the, the reality is, is messy. That's why mm -hmm. it's very important to try to understand also the different scenarios and assess them and follow them mm -hmm. and really think of the impact to your own organization. And that's actually exactly one of the biggest reasons to do scenario planning, because it's a training exercise. I, well, one way to think about it is, well, if you imagine yourself standing on a high hill, and you know that there's a large valley in front of you, but it's pitch black. You don't see anything, but you know that there's a valley, and you need, know that you need to cross that valley on your entrepreneurial journey. Mm -hmm. That's how it feels like every now and then. That's, that's a very typical feeling. I, I know that very well. And you see one lit path crossing the valley. That's your plan. 
and you think that this is the way I will cross that valley. But you don't see anything else in the valley. You don't know whether there are rivers, whether there are mountains, wow. whether there are high cliffs, wild animals, you name it. You don't know. You don't see anything. Yeah. If you try to create a few scenarios on how I can cross that valley, you can think of that as seeing several lit paths crossing the valley, and you actually see an overview of the, the countryside, of the terrain in the valley. Which means that no matter which path you will be following, you are better prepared to engage and react to whatever will happen. Because you know that there's a, there's a river, it, yeah. it looks deep. Yeah. There's clearly a pride of lions over there. Yeah. And your people will know that as well. Exactly. Because when you do the scenario, people will train their minds. Okay, if that would happen, then these are the actions we should take. And at least they are quicker to take them. They are more agile in reacting to surprises. So it's, a, it's really a training exercise. Very interesting, yeah. You, some, some time ago you mentioned that uh, these sort of scenario assessments energizes mm. staff. That was a very interesting point to me and I feel the same than when we are looking eye to eye the problems and challenges and risks. That's actually empowering and mm. ener energizing exercise for all because then you are not unconsciously or, or, or some, somewhat else sort of hiding certain topics yeah. etc. It's, it's, it's burdensome. It takes energy out of you if you yeah. try to avoid risks consciously or unconsciously. And then the black, black sort of valley uh, sort of figure, I, 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 I saw a path that my, my, one of my friends as a startup CEO is, said that he's been, he's been uh, tramping on that there have been some, some challenges, but now they have found a blue lagoon, mm -hmm. sort of where they can now drink in, in quiet, and there's no nobody an else. Oasis. An oasis, yeah. There's, uh, they, they can drink from that because they have so nice product and uh, they have a, such a good marketplace there. Mm -hmm. And I think that they are now very satisfied there. But Sometimes it's better to find a blue lagoon rather than a blue ocean. Mm, I'm sure. But but then again, you start thinking in in this world that all all of the businesses will be disrupted at some point, probably due to automation and machine learning, etc. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's that's a really good point because that's closer to the let's say strategic side of risk management. It's it's not just thinking about whether we will be disrupted, as in that being a huge risk, but it's also how do I disrupt? Exactly. And then it, it's, you're still talking about the same underlying phenomena, but you're thinking about it from a strategic context. But then if we really think about just the, the negative side of risk management, what can happen to us? And if something is already happening, and the company is suffering, loss making, laying off people, everything is falling on top of you. And then you sort of have a few alternative ways of behaving. One is being open. You engage people. Let's think about the risks going forward, different scenarios, how do we survive, what bad can happen. And people will even have to face the possibility of a bankruptcy perhaps. Yeah. Bankruptcy, how could it happen? What would be the first steps that would lead us to bankruptcy from where we are today? What can we do right now to not take that first step? Interesting. What action can we take? Sometimes reverse engineering sort of the negative scenario. Yeah. And for every step you think about mitigation. And the fact is that A, the fact that you can talk about that means that it's not such a bad thing after all. It's mm. not as likely because people have this inbuilt feeling that if it would already be happening, they wouldn't dare talk about it. True. It's so scary that we can't even talk about it. Yeah. So we talk about it, it becomes less scary. Yeah. We take action to mitigate, to prevent, to reduce the likelihood. So people get something to do that will decrease the likelihood of that bad thing happening. They feel in control. 
Yep. The worst thing is that things are happening to you. It's much better when you are influencing yourself with your actions, what yeah. will be happening. Very interesting point. And that makes me think that when the leadership, whenever they have a challenging topic to talk about, why not to transfer that into risk and make the staff to assess that risk mm. and manage that risk in a sense? But why, why to, you know, too, too much ponder about the risks or, or the challenges yourself in the leadership team or, or executive committees, mm. etc. Because I think that everybody at the end of the day probably feel and understand that there are risks in the air. So, and often the people lower in the organization may even know more about what's already happening than people in the top management. Exactly. And these kinds of collaborative processes can be a way for the management to realize what everyone else already knew. Yeah. Every now and then, we, we often in the risk assessments, we, we differentiate the answers based on the leadership team and the others. And then we see, are the lead, is the leadership more optimistic or pessimistic mm. in their general assessments? And oftentimes when they are a little bit more pessimistic, that's a good thing because then mm -hmm. they really, they are unsettled about the things they think that there's risks and realizing and so, so on. But if they are actually less worried about the risks than their staff, then they have to stop and think mm -hmm. what is going on yeah. and ask and really read what the staff is writing about the risks mm -hmm. and understand them. Yeah. Can you tell some examples or, or, or thoughts on, on the upsides and, and downsides doing scenario planning and risk management only, only sort of as, an, as a necessary evil because I feel that many organizations mm -hmm. consider risk management a table that you have just have to feel and then it's handled and it's not really in the culture in the decision making or in the thinking process of, of those corporations which is weird because at the end of the day, there are risks mm -hmm. for themselves. How do, how do you see this, this, this sort of mentality and, and the culture towards the risks? Do you have any, any, any sort of examples on the, on the upsides of taking risks serious, seriously and, and the downsides of not taking them sure. seriously? Sort of the traditional best-in-class enterprise risk management focuses on, on risks, what bad things can happen. I'd much rather integrate that more deeply into the strategy process, to the positive side of things. Yep. What can we do to influence the, the world around us and our own success? Risk management should be an integral part of that so that it's a top management issue, it's a strategic process, but of course it also leads to a number of actions, mitigation actions, that will be distributed to the organization as in traditional enterprise risk management. But it, it needs to be brought up as something positive, because we are all human beings and we, yeah. we still yeah. behave pretty much like we did 50,000 years ago in the jungle. Yeah. And who likes to talk about negative things? True. It's not fun. It, it's burdensome. Yeah, and it, People get depressed yes. by that. So yeah. enterprise risk management therefore becomes a sort of a check in the box. Yeah. Of course, the, the teams that do it, they typically try to do a really good job. There's an enterprise risk management officer in the company who's really you know, into it, but people around them just think, that, okay, that's a check in the box. Yeah. Something we have to do. It's great that someone is thinking about it. Yeah. I don't need to. And that doesn't work well. So combine the negative side of risk management to the positive side of creating a great business and a great company. And I think that's the, the union that we need to aspire to. Very true. And, and often we have advised our, our, our clients to, to add and or ask them. Often they have asked us if whether INCLUS can actually facilitate both aspects. So more often they, they look at the risks and, and the topics of the risks, and mm -hmm. then you have different events and, and, and consequences of those events, and then impacts of those consequences, etc. to your business. So it's a logical chain, but when you stay in the topic level, 
on the topic level they they, they can be also positive mm -hmm. impacts or positive events so so it's more easy then to to look at your risks stay in the topic level and then assess the impact and probability of the risks realizing on those topics but then just add one criteria how big opportunities this mm -hmm. topic provides us so think about the, co the construction important. industry that you you mentioned yeah a typical risk would be that the site will be over budget well there's there's a continuum of over budget this end and under budget at this end mm -hmm. so it's an opportunity as yeah. well as a risk yeah or you are over time or maybe you're early ready early and if you just think about the the negative side of things and then you think about mitigating actions you're sort of looking at only one side of the coin very true and in construction sector they do they of course have to bow down to the iron triangle of, of time money and quality mm -hmm. and 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 we have found out that when you also do as one criteria the cost impact of the risks and do an assessment based on that with a collaborative tool like inclus then you get at least an estimate how expensive the risks would mm -hmm. be because some risks with, which would have a negative impact in the timetable or the quality etc are not expensive perhaps in, in the sense often they are also expensive but you have these risks which 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 are less having less impact maybe on the overall uh, success of the project but would still be still cost money a lot mm -hmm. of money uh, to you and in those larger larger projects we have uh, estimated that uh, when we are talking about 100 million and above projects in our experience, uh, a single risk costs 1 million euro if it realizes fully. And in a, a large project of, of one of our clients, uh, the project manager said that, that in that project before they were using, we using our tool, uh, over half of the identified risks actually sort of eventuated and, and they, they, they tried to manage them, but mm -hmm. so and so. So one, one of the benefits of inclus is also also not only to assess the risks but also to come up with actions and activities mm -hmm. how to really manage the risks in a collaborative manner so it's a, it's an interesting analytical exercise when you're thinking about the probability and impact of the risk you are more ready then to think about the actions mm -hmm. you should never separate those two anal analytical sort of processes and that's where we are aiming for to to really collect the good actions so you have a solid solid plan Mm -hmm. after after the inclus process but i think as a mental picture instead of thinking of something as a sort of this is the optimal outcome this is our plan and then everything is sort of downside from there all the risks that might happen will bring us down from the unreachable completely sort of out of this world original target <laughs> Instead, of, we should, as a mental picture, think yeah. about this is where we will aim, and we could end up here. But this is where we will aim, and if if more risks happen than we expect, then we might be below that point. But actually, of course, we aim to manage everything so well that we'll be above. And then it's not just a sort of the negative side of risk management. It's also an opportunity to do better. Exactly, yeah. And that was an interesting point because it's also a good finding if there's no point in doing the risk assessment so that you, you assess that most of the risks are quite low uh, risks at this stage. But to monitor and follow them over time is, is crucial mm -hmm. to understand if a, if a low risk is actually rising to a medium yeah. risk. Is it going to continue to a very high risk? And then you should be capturing the risk when it's in the medium mm -hmm. size. Uh, medium impact impact level uh, and there we can actually also see in inclus the the actual trends and, mm -hmm. and and the movement of the risks and on the other hand whether the activities and action points have really actually made an made an impact in the mitigation sense have they mitigated so you can see actually are they are the risks coming down mm -hmm. uh, and, and which which ones are and so on so uh, interesting interesting points uh, while using inclus in, in quite quite difficult and, 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 and sort of 
high profile processes like you've you've done uh, in in your mind what have been the the key benefits uh, so far using inclus in your in your particular projects well the key benefits are that you can engage a large number of people at the best most convenient time to them one by one exactly to provide information to analyze information and then you have a tool that makes it very easy for you to understand the outcome. And one aspect that I really like as well is, is once you have set a course or something that we expect to happen, our action plans, then you can also start tracking how well you are doing. And you can see how, for example, if you're doing risk management, how certain risks are coming up or going down and then you can shift your resources so that the upcoming risks get more attention and the risks that are becoming less likely they get re less resources or you can track an action plan you can see over time as people let's say on a monthly basis or weekly basis they will fill in the the questionnaire you can see that okay it seems that for these action items we are doing really well, for these action items we have not even started and, and so forth. It doesn't replace a project management application, but for strategic thinking purposes it is actually a much better tool. Exactly, exactly to get uh, at least a good snapshot of the yeah. actual situation every now and then. And, and, or people's yeah. perception of the actual situation. Yes, because yes. it doesn't need to be hard data. It's it's how people feel, exactly. and that's more difficult to capture than something that you can measure with a sensor. Very true, and in in class we can also combine hard data for for comparison mm -hmm. reasons. So you can see whether certain risks which are perceived as 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 high risks, whether they actually have been previously mm -hmm. or. Uh, whether they are costly, costly risks uh, based on the hard data, etc. So that's also interesting. Uh, concerning business continuity planning and, and management, uh, we have developed a module in Inclus on, on mapping out uh, the systemic uh, interdependencies of any, any ecosystem or organizations, functions, actors, uh, external suppliers, etc. And, and that's something that is very interesting to us and very important to us as we are also also been working with uh, with the Alto, Alto University Systems Analysis Laboratory and so on from where my co-founder Juha is, is from originally in a, in a sense as a re researcher. Uh, we feel that there's 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 quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of risks which you could mitigate if you would just simply map out your in that interdependencies and it's it's very simple with our tool it takes like 10 minutes for you to assess what are the disturbances that those others are causing to me if they would get disturbed mm -hmm. that's that's so simple and then you get the overall picture and of course then the 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 holistic system view view becomes a little bit complicated because you get all of the uh, linkages for example if you have 20 uh, organizations they in theory have 400 links, but then again, you just assess those links, which are the most important, or those suppliers, mm -hmm. etc., which are most important. Um, but this is something very interesting, which is not done enough either, because it's it's analytically difficult, and they've been traditionally done by analysts or analyst uh, software, where one single analyst is going through numbers and desk uh, studies and interviews and and they cost like hundreds of thousands of euros and when the data comes it's it's old already the top management want to understand the results and etc it, it's it's easily easily a burdensome process so uh, we we try to capture capture some of those challenges in in our tool uh, in your experience uh, could you share some sort of challenges in, in different interdependencies when it comes to, to supply chains or or the internal functions of the organization or, or, or so. Mm -hmm. As you said, it's, it's typically 
such a challenging analysis process for businesses that it's, it's really done very deeply. But I think we have all received a wake-up call with COVID-19 where the first level impacts are very easy to understand. Let's say people just get sick, they infect others, borders are closed. So what are the second level impacts? Well, airlines suffer greatly. That's a second level impact. What does that mean? Well, airports suffer greatly. Let's say in some remote cities, small cities, the local airport is suffering. Less flights in. So what's the next level impact? The companies that operate in that remote city have less ways of transporting their goods because the airline travel is down. And maybe they will need to build different types of logistic chains that they were not prepared to be using because they have always used the airlines. And then you can take the next step. What does it mean that their logistic chains are disrupted to their people, to their business, their profitability? And, and these are very difficult chains of impacts yes. to, to understand if you don't really stop and think about them. And these same types of logical chains exist in companies and, and they are not always easy. It's, it's very simple to say that you need to have a dual supply strategy. Let's say what happened between the United States and China, where certain Chinese companies have been, at least potentially, they have become unreliable suppliers. If they can't get parts from US-based companies, then they can't do what some, let's say, German companies have been using them for. So it's obvious that businesses need to have two suppliers. But that's, that's sort of the simple stuff. What, when you go two levels down, it becomes much more murky and, and difficult to understand. And there, analytical tools such as Inclus can really help mm -hmm. you because then you can harness the, the brain power and understanding of a much larger number of people. Then you can start, start tracking those chains, logical chains of influence. Yeah. But I think it's something that mo many companies just need to experiment with. Yes, that's true. It's not, not a simple exercise. That's true. Although with the Inclus you can get to the good start quite easily and quite fast and, and, and to quite a bit deep depth as well. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, because uh, even you, 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 we always live in inside systems which are inside systems which are inside systems and you have, you know, never ending uh, pool of factors that you should be considering mm -hmm. when you're doing, doing uh, sort of systems analysis, etc. But I, I believe that only if organizations would just map out their basic functions and their, their interdependencies and the vulnerabilities that they have between each other. And then figure out if we would get an external shock to this function, how it would be then cascading mm -hmm. throughout the organization. What about if the, if the shock would come to this? So then, it, then it's even quite close to scenario planning and as such. So then you just have to be managing well your own in the, in the dependencies within your organization. Think about the externalities uh, then sort of separately, but also with Inclus you can add those external shocks to your own assessment of your interdependencies. And, and we've been working with, uh, with, with, with gov some governments uh, which have been using, using Inclus for, for this particular uh, matter. So as understanding how different industries, how different uh, organizations mm -hmm. impact each other in, 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 um, in crisis situations like, like now in COVID. Because you might think that no, 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 no critical uh, function is actually in, impacted that much. But non-critical function can then have a cascading mm -hmm. uh, impact on a little bit more critical function, which is having then mm -hmm. impact on your critical function. 
and then to understand where you should actually stop the vicious cycle or, or the, the sort of cascading effects, where, where you should be investing your resources for the resilience of the whole system. Uh, and, and yes, it becomes a, a, a challenging analytical process, but, but if we don't do it, it, it's more expensive. Yeah, but I really think, as I said, that we have gotten a wake up call on the need to understand these chains of consequences with COVID-19, which has step by step changed the way we live our lives at the moment. Very true. Why, why do you think that a, a systematic approach to business continuity is, is, is important? Or do you think uh, that systematic approach? Well, is there really an alternative? <laughs> yeah. I, it's such a complex matter yeah. that I don't really think there is an alternative. But the fact has been that the tooling to help make the systematic approach easy has been lacking. So I think that's an area where Inclus can, can help a lot yeah. by making something that is difficult and cumbersome to do systematically because it becomes complex. Now with Inclus, it can be manageable. Exactly. And I've, I've said to some of our, our clients who have been also using risk management module, but then looking at the, at the business continuity interdependency tool that could we do something with that? Mm -hmm. I've been saying, yes, give me 10 minutes of your staff time. Mm -hmm. In 10 minutes, they can assess the most critical interdependencies if you send it separately to everybody and you get immediately the systemic, systemic picture of your organization. So it's, it's actually, actually easier than mm -hmm. some might think. Mm -hmm. At least you, you get to start. Exactly, exactly. Moving forward to the, to the future, uh, I, I know that you you like to think and talk about machine learning and you've been studying and, and, and coding also applications on it. Uh, but when we're talking about the, the sort of foresight, uh, foresight of, of, of humans, <laughs> how does, how does uh, or foresight capabilities of humans, how, how do you see, do you have any, any sort of visions how machine learning could help to foresee better the future we have some ideas and, and mm -hmm. uh, it would be very interesting to hear, hear you, your views on this. Well, machine learning is definitely platform technology. And a platform technology is one where it's practically impossible to, to envision all the ways it can be used. Yes. It's like electricity. When electricity was invented, nobody envisioned but a 1% of all the ways that electricity can be used. And machine learning is similar, but definitely the ability to collect a huge amount of data, which the humankind is now doing at a level never seen before. And tomorrow that level will be higher than today. And take all that data and analyze the data to find correlations and causalities that we have not known before is is a huge opportunity. However, for the time being, it's much more important to have a clear question in your mind that you're looking for an answer to. And then you use machine learning and data that you have access to, to try to answer that question. People have this misconception that machine learning is, is sort of an alien intelligence that can just take data and distill some wisdom out of that. It, yeah. it, really doesn't typically work like that. Yeah. But of course you can use that for foresight when you have figured out the right question. And Inclus can help you figure out that question, what is really relevant and material to you. For example, scenarios. You have five scenarios. You need to know which one is most probable based on the data we have today you can, that's a question. Then you can try to figure out a way for machine learning to analyze that data and give you an indication of the trend lines of probability. Yeah. But maybe another example where machine learning is, is sort of relevant and it's more to, to leadership and how companies are built and managed. 
because one of the essential ways to categorize different generations of companies is to answer the question of how do these companies manage uncertainty. The traditional way to manage uncertainty is through planning. You have a waterfall type of a process for planning. It's slow and it's cumbersome and it definitely doesn't react to changes very well. And it typically is built on a hierarchical organizational model where the CEO knows everything. And then he commands the staff to, to plan. And you can plan for surprises as well, but the planning process is slow. Then you have an innovation organization where things happen quicker because the way you plan for or manage uncertainty is through experimentation. You try to be prepared for whatever happens by experimenting with different things all the time. And then you know very early what works, what doesn't work. And you sort of automatically have several scenarios and you try to understand how they function and which one is likely and which one is not. And then you have a data oriented company. And there you do experimentations, but you do them in a virtual world because you simulate. And whereas the innovation organization might do 10 different experiments at the same time, if you can simulate them, you can maybe do a million experiments at the same time on a daily basis. Both the innovation organization and this data oriented organization will require you to build your company differently. You can't just sort of glue these principles on top of a hierarchical waterfall thinking way of running a business. You actually have to change your principles. And as we go to the future, if we want to use new technologies, we may have to question the fundamentals of how our companies are built in order to do, for example, what you asked about, how we create foresight for the future. The foresight is of little value if we can't act on it. And if we get True. constant foresight almost in real time, and then the board only meets once a month, and you have to wait for the next board meeting before you make a decision, then it doesn't help. Very true. And I guess, I guess we have envisioned a couple of ways to, to strengthen still uh, INCLUS, and we are working on them basically on, on, on data sources, how they feed into the assessments, on, on the, also on the reliability and the fact-checking side of things. Um, and also maybe the, the timeliness of the assessments of, of, of whether they, they, the things that are assessed are timely and, mm -hmm. and so on. But, but that's, that's also a very, very interesting field to, to dive oh, deeper yes. into. Oh, yes. And you said that you have a couple. I think you have many tens of things that you are thinking about and working on. Yes. Inclus is such a, you know, such a wonderful space that it's so easy to come up with ways to increase the power of that platform. Of course, you need to choose a problem or a customer or a dimension or a need that you want to primarily serve. But the tool is, is a really wonderful tool in the sense that it can be used for so much. That's exactly right, and that's why it's so inspiring to work at Inclus, with Inclus, and, and with yourself. And that's it's, why I'm so happy to be on board. Thank you, Risto, for this interview. It was very inspiring and enlightening. Thank you. It was good fun. Definitely. And if you're interested in Inclus, please visit our website, inclus.com, and do send me a message whenever you have any idea, uh, thought, or project in mind. 
on, on which we could discuss more or collaborate. I'm always available for you. Thank you.